Heavenly Father, we love you. And Lord, we praise you. We are here today because of you. And Lord, we, we think about Memorial Day and what it means to us, about those that have given their lives for freedom. But Lord, all of that would be for naught if it had not been for Jesus who gave his life for freedom. So Lord, we thank you for the sacrifice that you have made for our lives. And Lord, may this service honor those that have paid the ultimate price. But Lord, may it honor the person of Jesus Christ who has paid the ultimate price. We love you and we praise you. Help our hearts to honor you today, Lord. And I bind any distraction of man, woman, or devil that may try to put themselves up against the word of God this morning. Please bless our speaker, Lord, as he brings the word of God to us. I thank you so much for his life and his ministry and his family, Lord. I pray nothing but blessings upon them. Would you always be the center of their household, I pray, in the name of of Jesus. Make him an open conduit for your word that your Holy Spirit may have free reign in his heart and with his mind right now, Lord, as you breathe the word of God into him. Thank you so much, Lord, for what you're doing in the heart and the life of this church. We'll give you the praise and the glory for you deserve it. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Would everyone please stand and join me as we pledge allegiance to the Bible. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path and will hide its words in my heart that I may not sin against God. join me as we pledge allegiance to the Christian flag. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands, one brotherhood uniting all mankind in service and in love. Allegiance to the American flag. 
pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please join me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for those that have given the ultimate price for freedom. We pray for their families today, those who still mourn loved ones, Lord, who have fallen on the field of battle. We do not take lightly the liberty that has been afforded to us and whose men and women have shed their blood for the freedom that we hold so dearly today that we may gather today in a house of worship to lift up the name of Jesus who paid the ultimate price and shed his blood on Calvary's cross we thank you so much Lord for the country that we live in but more so for the God that we serve Thank you so very much, Father, for what Jesus has paid for our sins. May we never abuse that freedom. May we always uphold that liberty that we have been forgiven of our sins. Father, we thank you for that. In the name of Jesus, amen. Um, if you walked in this morning... Then, um, if you walked in through these front doors, then you saw a table that was sitting there, and that's called the table of the missing soldier. And uh, I'm going to have George Graves, who is a Vietnam vet, come up, and he's going to read to you and and uh, what that table stands for, and the the well, the imagery that is given because of that table. Okay, so when you walk back by today, when you leave here. We want you to know what the, everything on that table stands for, okay? All right, George, if you would. The missing man table, I will read. The table is round, showing our everlasting concern for our missing men. The tablecloth is white, symbolizing the purity of their motives when answering the call of duty. The single red rose reminds of the life of each one that's missing and the loved ones and friends of these Americans who keep the faith waiting answers. The vase is tied with a red ribbon, symbol of our continued determination to account for our missing. The candle is lit, symbolizing our uncompromising and unquenchable spirit. The lemon, the slice of lemon, reminds us of the bitter 
tears of those captured and missing in a foreign land. The pinch of salt symbolizing the tears endured by those missing and their families who seek answers. The Bible represents the strength gained through faith to certain to certain those lost from our country that were that was founded as one nation under God. The glass is inverted. They cannot toast with us this day. The chairs are empty because they are missing. All gave some, some gave all. the day that Kevin first drew out the basis for me. He had been searching for a metaphor to teach his son about spiritual life. He pulled out a napkin and he pulled out a pen and he drew out the basis for me. Well, I grew up with the home run teaching. I mean, I've been hearing that since middle school and luckily I got to have that as part of the ethos of what I was as a filmmaker and what we were as a film company. We'd have a lot of temptation to choose people who were really competent at their jobs but lacked in character, and we decided that we needed to build character first, and we'd have to go, um, you know, the long way around. When I worked in the restaurant business, I was there because I love food, I love creating with that. The people were a problem. It occurred to me one day, I thought, everything God did, He did for people. I don't have the luxury of checking out. What I've realized is that it's purpose and integrity and relationship and performance that leads to achieving what God has called you to do. Okay, guys, that series starts next Sunday. We're going to launch that series. It's called A Home Run Life. It has two things that I love, Jesus and baseball about it. So um, I, I can't wait to, to I'm, I'm excited. I wish I was starting it this Sunday and preaching it because I'm already that excited about it. But it's great. You're, it's a great series. And let me tell you a little bit about that series real quick, okay? Um, most of the sermon series that you hear here at Waterbrook are created in-house, meaning that we do the work here in-house. We do the videos and the promos and we, we do all the templates and all that stuff in-house. But that is a out-of-the-house sermon series, and it's one that we've been looking at for years now. Um, well, not years, this past year. We've been looking at it probably for the last nine months, 
and um, it was created by Kevin Myers and 12 Stone Church in Atlanta, Georgia. And um, it is a great, great sermon series if you have children or teenagers and you've been wanting to figure out how do I disciple them? You know, or if you have ever sat there and wondered, what's the best, what's God's plan for discipleship for me? You know, how does that look? What does that work? How do, what does that work like? We're, we're going to unpack that over this next, well, it's a five-week series, okay? It's a short series because you just went through a 10-week series. So that's kind of, you know, we're going to give you a break there. Um, but it, it's a five, it's a five-week series. Don't, don't miss it. I am. That, that's going to be so much fun, and we're so excited about it, okay? But today, we have a special guest speaker that um, God, we were trying to figure it out. Lisa and I were talking, and I know the Conrads were talking this week, too. We've known Randy. Randy Conrad is our, is our guest speaker. We've known him and Melissa um, for about 13 years, I'm thinking. We both came out of the same home, home church. And uh, we have both had the same pastor, Pastor Keith Carroll, Dr. Keith Carroll, who is uh, probably one of the best preachers I've ever heard, one of the best pastors I've ever seen, one of the best all-around people. We both came out of that church serving, and, uh, and he's a church planner like I am. And uh, he left, and they went to like, you guys went to Greensboro, but then you ended up way out, you ended up in Mars Hill, is that right? Rose Hill. Is, Rose Hill, Rose Hill. What did I say, Mars Hill? <laughs> okay, Rose here. <laughs> They've got two beautiful children, although Nathan does like to be called beautiful. He's handsome, name's Nathan, and I always want to call her Haley, but it's Kaylee. Yeah. And, and I always want to, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, but would you guys uh, please give Randy a warm welcome as he brings God's word to us today, would you? Well, good morning, Waterbrook. See, that's what I told the first service. I love it. I'm echoing a little bit. That's okay. You just get to hear it a little bit more. It has that power to it, right? But, uh, no, I love that. I told the first service. I've been watching a couple services online, and, uh, you know, every time Scott gets up and he's like, good morning, Waterbrook. And y'all are like the liveliest bunch of people that I have ever heard. I absolutely love it. Just so you know, I'm one of those guys who loves feedback. I love people to be loud, so don't worry. You're not going to bother me. You want to stand up, shout, and holler. Sound good? All right. Oh, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. We'll get better. It's okay. No, you know, we've talked about this morning. We've already been going over with Memorial Day, and, and that's a very special time for me, very important time for me. Uh, as a veteran, um, I, I really do appreciate and remember the honor and honor the sacrifice that so many people have given. So many men and women have have given the ultimate sacrifice for, for our country. And this morning we've done an amazing job of showing that, but I wanna go just a step further for a minute. And if you're here this morning and you have a family member or even a friend of yours that has given their life and sacrificed to our country, would you just please stand for just a moment? Um, thank you, thank you. I as well have had friends who, who've done that. Please, yes. <clears throat> It's important, I believe, to honor those who have gone before and who have given that sacrifice because, you know, certainly this morning we, we know that Jesus gave all, right? We, we understand that. But, but for our country, for us as individuals, the people who have sacrificed themselves voluntarily for no reason, who, who go out and do that, have given a lot of themselves. And families today, while we may be in this town celebrating and, and bikes, See, now he's going to mess me up and strangle my hands. <laughs> if you were here this morning, you understand. I, I like the hand thing, but that's okay. I'll, I'll make it work. This, this weekend, so many people are celebrating, right? We have bikes outside. People were planning on barbecues this weekend before Bonnie decided to make a, an appearance. I'm going to kind of mess with that a little bit. But there's a lot of people around this country right now who aren't celebrating this weekend. They're remembering, and they're struggling because they may have just in the past week or so, lost a family member overseas. We have people that are serving right now so that we can be here and do what we're doing. So, so this morning, we just honor you, those for you who stayed up. We, we thank you for that very much. 
Um, as Pastor Scott said, we've known each other for going on 13, possibly 14 years. We didn't figure it out the other night. Melissa and I kept trying to figure it out as well. Um, we came out of a, a wonderful church, Mount Zion. We both attended the same college in High Point for a little while. And then somehow we both decided to come down to the beach. Right, as he said, you got to suffer and serve the Lord somewhere, and might as well come down to the, might as well come down to a good view while you're doing it. So, we made our way over. We went to to Rose Hill, North Carolina, for a, and served at a church there, and then planted a church down here several years ago. Um, but we are just excited and and happy to be here. My wife Melissa, my two kids, um, just love the people here, love what we've already seen this morning, and are excited to be here. Are you excited to be here? Yeah. Amen. Yes. There really is no better place, is there? There's no other place that I would rather be than here. There's nothing I would rather be doing today than this. There's no other people I would rather be with than you. Why? Because God's here. Because we're here to to celebrate and to worship a risen Savior. And in all of that, we can celebrate and we can have fun, right? Church can be fun. We can shout. We can holler. Okay, see, Nathan is a huge basketball guy. He plays basketball. My son loves basketball. Everything about him is basketball. And if anybody knows or keeps any basketball fans here, anybody at all, anybody else sit up real late with me last night and watch a game? I got one person who was willing to. We stayed up all night last night watching because Golden State is our team. That is our team. That is our guy. We want to see them go on to the very end. We want to see them win this thing. And so last night we're sitting there watching the TV at midnight because I wanted them to win. Because if you don't know, they had to win to be able to go on to Game 7, which is tomorrow. I work and can't watch it, but Game 7 is tomorrow, and that will decide if they go on to the finals. So we were up, Melissa went to bed around 10.30 last night, and Nathan and I are downstairs, and I'm a bad person to watch sports with because I get loud. Really loud. And so they're making plays, and I'm just screaming and yelling and hollering, and as good as that was, and as much as I love my basketball, I love this more. And I love being in the presence of the Lord a whole lot more. So if we can celebrate with that, then we can celebrate today, right? Amen. Amen. This morning, I'm going to be going to Joshua chapter 4. If you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn there. I will get there in just a minute. But I like to give a little bit of backstory before I go into the scripture. I like to to learn a little bit. I'm a facts kind of guy in some ways. So Joshua 4 is where we're going to be going. But there's a little bit that happened before that. Do you remember, maybe you don't, in the story of the the Exodus, we get into the, the end of Deuteronomy. And God leads Moses up onto the mountain. He looks over into the promised land. And God says, I'm going to give you a view of the promised land. You're going to see it, but you're never going to step foot into the promised land. Because of the the disobedience and the things that happened during the journey, during the exodus of the people of Israel, Moses couldn't enter into. So that leads us into Joshua chapter 1. And there we see Joshua being installed as the leader, as the person who God is placing in charge to take his people, the people of Israel, into the promised land. He says, Joshua, be strong and be courageous because you will lead my people into the promised land. Get into chapter 2. Chapter 2, Joshua sends two spies over into Jericho because for them to enter into the promised land, they had to go through Jericho. That was the city that led them into the promised land. And so he sends two spies over, and they go into Jericho at night. They sneak in. They come to this house of this woman named Rahab. She's a prostitute. And in this house, they they find out that she believes in their God. She believes in what they're doing, and she wants to help them in any way she can if they will promise safety for her family. And these two spies say, yes, of course, we'll provide safety. If you will hang a, a scarlet rope out of your window when we come in, and if all of your family are inside the house, those who are inside the house will be safe as we enter into and take Jericho. That's chapter 2. Then we get into Joshua chapter 3, and now we find the the crossing, which is going to lead us up to what I'm going to speak on this morning in in chapter 4, the memorial that gets built afterwards. But in Joshua chapter 3, we have these people of Israel, and God has commanded them, said, Joshua, I want you to lead your people into the Jordan River. I want you to take your priests, who are going to hold the Ark of the Covenant, and they're going to step into the Jordan River, and I will provide safe crossing. When they step into the Jordan River, the waters will stop, and I'm going to allow the people of Israel to cross over into the Promised Land. That's Joshua chapter 3. Before we get into end of 4 for just a minute, my mind works in strange ways. Anybody else do that sometimes? Okay, good. I'm, I'm glad I'm among my, fan, my friends here. But see, when I read Scripture, I read a story, and I'm like, it's good to, to see it on paper, 
I read that they crossed the Jordan River. That's wonderful, amazing things that God did, but that just doesn't do enough for me. So I've got to kind of understand how that happened. So this week I got to, to praying and thinking, I was like, well, what's a, a big river that we have nearby that could serve as an illustration? Anybody been down to the waterway? Been on the water? You've been down that way, right? Okay, so I started doing some research on, on the waterway, and the intercoastal waterway averages 90 feet across. That's the average, uh, average width is 90 feet. The average depth across it is around 12 feet. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, they dredge it, they keep it around a 12-foot depth to allow safe passage. So I want you to take that image that you have here in your head of the, the waterway, and when we talk about this crossing over the Jordan River, the Jordan River in chapter 3, it says, was running at flood stage. Flood stage for the Jordan River was roughly 350 feet wide and approximately 10 to 15 feet deep. Everybody got that image in your head? Okay, so if I'm going to go out to the, the waterway right now, and I'm going to try and walk across, or I'm going to believe that when I step in that the waters are going to move, well, okay, well, that's 90 feet. But we're talking over three times, almost four times the width of the waterway that the water just stops and backs up. Not only does it back up, it says it backs up to a town called Adam which is approximately 30 miles from where they were at crossing over into Jericho. Okay. So if we take where we're sitting now, and we think of the swing bridge in Socasty, everybody kind of got an image of where we're at? That's about 30 miles according to MapQuest. Okay, so at the point that we're crossing now, imagine that you were to walk up to the waterway, and you were going to step across the waterway, and all of the water just backs up for 30 miles from here down to the swing bridge. It says the water kept going downstream, so they were allowed passage. See, it gets a little bit different, doesn't it? We hear the stories, we read the stories, but it, it, for me, it's a little bit more powerful when I can actually put an image in my mind of seeing the true power of what God did in this story. Okay, so that's the first three chapters. We're going to get into chapter 4 here in just a second. If you have your Bibles, Joshua chapter 4, verse 1. It says, When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe. Tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, right from where the priest stood, and to carry them over with you. Put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the twelve men he appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, said to them, Go report with the ark of the Lord your God in the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, What do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of of Israel forever. So the Israelites did just as Joshua commanded them. They took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, as the Lord had told Joshua. They carried them over with them to their camp where they put them down. Skip down to verse 18. It says, And the priests came up out of the river, carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. No sooner had they set their feet on the dry ground than the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and ran at flood stage as before. On the tenth day of the first month, the people went from the Jordan, camped at Gilgal on the eastern border of Jericho. Joshua set up at Gilgal the twelve stones they had taken out of the Jordan. He said to the Israelites, In the future, when the descendants ask their fathers, What do these stones mean? Tell them. Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan just what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. He did this so that all the people of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this morning. God, I thank you for what has already happened in this service. I thank you for what already happened in the, the first service this morning. God, I would just pray that right now you would settle our hearts, tune our ears, tune our hearts towards you, Lord. That we might draw closer to you. That whatever has happened this morning, whatever is going on outside in our minds, Lord, that we would just simply be here in your presence. God, we remember those who gave the ultimate 
sacrifice. Lord, we celebrate them, we remember them, we honor them today. But Lord, more than that, we honor your sacrifice. Jesus, your death on the cross gave us life, gave us freedom. So while we remember and we celebrate Memorial Day, more than that, we remember and celebrate who you are. We thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing in this service. Lord, I just pray that today we would be different than we came in. That, God, you would just settle down in this service and everything we do from here on out, everything of this message would just be to your glory. Lord, you are so worthy of so much. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've got a little bit of backstory, right? We understand what went on in the, the first three chapters of Joshua. They, they began to go into the promised land. They had to cross over the Jordan. We get to chapter 4 that we just read, and we talk about the stones. And I'm going to get to the stones in just a minute, but when I think about this story, I think about this passage, this moment in time for the people of Israel, there, there's two points that I see. And the first one I want to cover is that it took a step of faith. There takes a step of faith. Anytime God calls us to do something, it requires something of us. He doesn't just say he's going to do something. He wants us to be a part of the story. Because by using you, it actually means more to us. It puts something on us that shows what he is going to do is for us. See, these, these priests, think about the priests, think about the people of Israel for 40 years. 40 years. They had wandered the desert. Forty years prior to this moment at the Jordan, God had delivered the Israelite people from slavery in Egypt. Forty years they had wandered. Forty years they had seen promise after promise of God come true. Forty years they had doubted. Forty years they had broken promises. Forty years they had disobeyed. Forty years they have made the point from being slaves to where they are now. Now see, for these priests, it's going to take a huge step of faith because in that 40-year period, all of the original ones had died. 40 years ago, their, descent, their, their family had had the crossing of the Red Sea, the parting of the Red Sea. 40 years ago, that had happened, but they had never seen that happen. They had never experienced it for themselves. So 40 years ago, God delivered the people from slavery... And now 40 years later, God's going to deliver his people from what was, from the old, from the past, into the future. Into the promise that he had made all those years ago was going to come true in that one moment. But see, to those, the priests, the the people, matter of fact, let's think about how many people there were. Scripture says that roughly at that moment across the Jordan River, there were between two to three million people people in Israel. Two to three million people. What's the population of Horry County right now? I think it runs around 300, 320,000, probably not off by many right there. About 300,000 people. So Horry County is just simply 10% of what was in this, this population that was going to have to cross the Jordan. Have we ever seen Horry County come together in one thing at one time and do it all the same? <laughs> exactly. It's kind of hard to get 300,000 people to do the same. It's kind of hard to get 200 people to do the same thing at the same time for the same reason because somebody said to. To get all of Horry County to go and decide to walk across the coastal waterway right now would probably not happen. But that's what Joshua's job is here. That's his task. He's got to lead 3 million people across the Jordan River into the promised land. You can only do that when God's telling you to do that. That's the only way you're going to lead that to happen. (laughs) Because I could say right now, let's go out and cross Highway 17 right now. Let's go. Let's just run across it. Don't wait on the lights. Don't wait on the crossing zone. Let's just go. And you're going to have people going, yeah, right. I'll watch. Because this is going to be good. Right? See, Joshua is taking these people on a journey because God has called them from somewhere to something. And it took a step of faith for those priests to to step into a river that is raging at flood stage. 350 feet to believe that the moment that I take that step, not only am I going to be safe, but the waters are going to stop. And for 30 miles, the water is going to back up. 
That's what's happening at this moment. I wonder this morning, how is our journey? How is our step of faith? What is our action being put into place that God has called you or asked you to do? How many times have we truly taken that step? Are we still on the other side of the bank saying, God, there's a river there. Lord, there's no way I can, there, there, there's no way I can do that. There's this obstacle in my path. And God's saying, if you would just simply take that one step, that obstacle wouldn't be there. But you're not trusting me enough to take the step. See, these priests had seen everything come and go, had been a part of what was going on, and they were simply the ones that were supposed to step out in the middle and let everyone else pass. For 40 years, the people of Israel have been wandering and traveling, waiting for the promised land that God had given them. Do you realize how long it would have taken them to go from Egypt to the promised land in a pretty direct route? It's actually less than that. They say you can make the trip in almost seven days, seven to 15 days, give or take, depending on the way you go. If they were to go from here to here, from Egypt to the promised land, they weren't ready. God had to do something in them first. So in doing something and getting them ready and prepared for this trip, it took 40 years to prepare them to a place that they were ready to enter into the promised land. And here they are getting ready to go in. In chapter 3, Joshua actually says, before we cross over, we need to take time to prepare ourselves. We need to take time to consecrate ourselves before the Lord, to prepare ourselves to enter into the glory, the promise that he has given us. You know, most of us, if you're like me, I won't generalize, But when I think of something that needs to happen and God has promised me something and telling me to go somewhere, I kind of want it done like that. Right? God's like, I'm going to give you this and I'm going to bless you with this. All right, God, I'm ready. Where's it at? After about a week of not seeing it, I'm like, well, God, maybe it wasn't really. For 40 years, they believed. 40 years, they traveled. 40 years, they journeyed to the point here that they've crossed over in this one step. Everything happened in that one step. Are you willing to take the step this morning? See, they not only took the one step, but they went into the middle of the river. And as the river parted, it backed up 30 miles to Adam and it continued to flow going south. And at that moment, all three million people were able to cross into what God had promised them. See, they didn't just cross over a river. You understand that, right? They didn't just cross over a river, but they went from what used to be, the old stuff, the, the, the stuff that used to happen. And they went into the promise that God had given them this new thing, this newness. The same thing happens to you and I. When we have an encounter with Jesus Christ and we accept him as our Savior, we go from the old to the new. We're not what we used to be. We're something different. That takes me to the second point. We first have to take a step of faith. The second is that we ourselves are living stones. 1 Peter chapter 2 says that we are living stones. See, when they get on the other side there in verse 18... It says, the priests came up out of the river carrying the Ark of the Covenant. No sooner had they set their feet on the dry ground than the waters of the Jordan returned to their place, ran at flood stage as before. So these 12 men go in and pick up stones. They carry them out of the river to the other side. The moment they get on the other side, Joshua tells the, the priests to come out of the river. They come out of the river and the water immediately returns. Does anybody ever question you for your faith? Anybody ever question you for your faith? You ever been told that if you would really think and if you were smart enough and had logic, you wouldn't believe in the stuff of the Bible? You get told that all the time. All the time. People are like, you know what? Why do you believe in this? It's just stories. If you really had a brain and you were to actually think and read through, you would see that none of that's true. None of that could happen. 
And I look at stories like this, and it's amazing because I use it all the time to tell people about Jesus because you realize the excuses people use for this Jordan River crossing? I have heard some crazy stories. One of them, that an earthquake happened. That the earth shook and the water stopped. And they were able to cross over. Because it was a natural phenomenon, it was just an earthquake. It was perfect timing. I always go to this next verse in 18 and say, really, the earth shook and the water just stopped perfectly so that the moment they stepped out of the water, the earth shook again and the water came behind them? That's harder to take than to believe that God did it. The other one is that, oh, maybe a, a big storm came up and the wind started blowing so strong. They use this for the, the Red Sea crossing as well. That it was a huge storm that just blew up and this, this hurricane and this tornado came up and the, the waves just passed and it, it made this beautiful place for them to cross. Well, he's like, well, then how did when they get to the other side, the wind just stop for no reason? But if not for God. I love when people try to discredit scripture by looking at stories and saying they couldn't come true. And I look at stories in scripture and say there's no way they could come true but by God. See, you and I are living stones. Joshua says they took these 12 stones and they carried them to the other side and they, they made a memorial out of them. They didn't just make a memorial just to have some stones stacked up. They made a memorial, as we're reading here, verses 22 and 23, so that when children come along and descendants come along and say, what is this here for? They can say, these stones are to remind us what God did when we crossed over. That God cut off the Jordan River and allowed us safe passage. See, you and I are the same way. We are those living stones. We are a memorial so that when people come along and they see you after you've had an encounter with Jesus and you're different and you're not what you used to be and things have changed and you're no longer the, the guy or the girl you used to be, but you're this new creation. And they say, what in the world happened to you? What is different? Oh, let me tell you about what Jesus did. Let me show you why. You're a memorial to other people just like those stones were a memorial to the future generations. Say, I have two teenage kids. Somebody has to tell them. Somebody has to show them the goodness and greatness of God. Guess what, church? That's our job. It's our job to be the one that can stand up and be something different and be separated and be able to say, you know why? Let me tell you about what Jesus did. See, I used to be a pretty screwed up guy. Good, he's busy. Last time I said that, he said amen. So I had to, see, I had to make sure he was hidden. He wasn't there. See, I was that guy that, you know, they, think about the Israelites. They were embodied in slavery. They were slaves to everything that was going on in Egypt, and God set them free. You and I are the same way. We are all, we're all slaves to something. Whether we were slaves to sin, slaves to addiction, slaves to, to, to heartache, slaves to ideas of having to be the best there is, slaves of something. But oh, then Jesus happened. And when we encountered who Jesus Christ was, we were no longer slaves to this world. We were, we were one with him. We were taken from the place we were and are something better. The promised land. Not because of anything we did. Those, those Israelites, they weren't going to be able to cross the Jordan River on their own. I mean, if you tell us, like today, honestly, if you were to say that we needed to go do that, half of you would decide, start trying to figure out how we need to build a bridge, right? Half of you would be on the other side being, we need to pray for God to do something. Half of you would be trying to figure out that another way to go around. That's like three halves, that doesn't work, but you know what I mean. We would all be trying to figure out something else of how to get around instead of being that one person that's saying yeah let's take that step into the water see God has called you to something God called you when you were born to be something great for him the problem becomes that so many of us look at the the things that we did we look at the person we used to be and we say there's no way God there's no way that you could really use me for something great. And today I'm thinking about these stones. Because the stones were hidden in the river. 
These 12 stones were stones that had never been probably seen by human eyes before, never been touched by a human hand before. They were buried under the sand. They were underneath rushing wind, uh, water. They were, they were hidden until God revealed them. And then he took them out of the dirt. He took them out of that river and set them on the side to be displayed for his glory. That's you and I. If you're here today and you're a believer of Jesus Christ, you were taken up from that place. You were taken up out of being hidden to where no one saw you before. You were taken up out of the stuff that you had at one time and he raised you up and he set you up. He didn't set you up for people to see you. He set you up for people to see him. Everything we do in life is to show him glory. See, so you and I each have different things, right? Some of y'all are better at something else than, than I am. I said in the first service that Scott's a whole lot funnier than I am. The kids laughed at that last time. He's better at things than I am. You're better at things than she is. I'm better at things than they are. It doesn't matter. Because when we all come together as the body of Christ, we all complement one another. We all have a purpose and a reason. The moment we come together, we're no longer individuals, but we are the body of Christ. Those 12 stones were nothing until they were picked up and set up in a memorial to him. We're living stones. We weren't meant to just be alone. We weren't meant to just exist we certainly weren't meant to stay hidden. My challenge to us this morning is, are we even trying to be what God has called us to be? Or are we simply existing and going through this thing called life just because? See, I get tired of just doing life. Anybody else? Life is hard, isn't it? Life is tough. Life will wear you down. But when life is tough and life wears us down, we always have somebody to reach out to. We have a Savior to cry out to, His promised to be there for us. We have somebody to cry out to that when we are in the worst possible place we can be, He is there to simply lift us up and say, I got you. It's okay. Are you going to be a living memorial for the people around you? This past week, our kids and our school, is, as Scott was praying about a, a boy named Jacob Causey, um, maybe some of you have heard the news or didn't hear the news, but our kids go to the school where he did at Calvary, and he's 17 years old, right in the prime of his life, took a trip out on a boat, and for whatever reason, he crashed, and he didn't survive. And so we went to his funeral this week, and and it was amazing to see the outpouring of love. It was amazing to see the things that happened. But, and all of that is expected. But it was amazing even more to see the overflowing outpouring of, of children, kids, aged probably 13 to 19. We were trying to, to figure out there were probably, there were probably five, 600 people in the service. The church was full. The fellowship hall was full. The parking lot was full. The memorial stretched from, you know, the church to the, a mile down the road to the cemetery. There was no gaps. It was literally bumper to bumper from there to there. Over 200 kids who were there to show. And that only happens when somebody shows and loves. Just like with Caleb. Their lives pointed to Jesus. In death, they point to Jesus. They live in such a way that when people come into contact with them, all they know is about Jesus. And even now in this struggle, and, and as our kids try to struggle and deal with this, and as the families try to struggle and deal with why, the, all the questions of why that's not fair, that doesn't make sense. When you see so many kids who come to know and love Jesus because of it, that's the memorial. That's the reason. Doesn't make sense. <laughs> it never will. But I want to be somebody like that. Am I really being a living memorial and pointing to somebody? Because that's what we're all called to do. 
And if we're not doing that with our lives, then what are we doing? We're just going through the motions, waiting on our time here to be over. The great theologian and and possibly much better comedian, Jim Carrey. Everybody know who I'm talking about? That's not a word you normally use with him, is it, theologian? Well, Jim Carrey, in a commencement speech not too long ago, stood up before all these graduating seniors ready to embark on something amazing in their life, right? And he said, everything you gain in life will rot and fall apart. All that will be left of you is what was in your heart. That's great words by him. They weren't meant to have any biblical meaning or anything else to, to these young graduating collegiates. But in that moment, he said something pretty profound. Because it's the same way with us. Everything that we have in life, all the stuff that we attain, all the things that we do, mean nothing. But the relationships that we build, the people that we tell about Jesus, the change that we make in somebody's life because of pointing them to Christ, means everything. Doesn't it? Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 6 says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This story in Joshua is much more than just crossing a river. That's wonderful. That's great. That's amazing. It's a a powerful thing to see what God did. But it was about taking a people from their past, taking a people from what was, and delivering them, saving them, bringing them to something new, something else. And this morning, the same message is for us, that God doesn't want us to stay over here. He, he raised us up, he changed us, he did something that so we could be on the other side. So that we could stand up and show people who he is. There are too many people outside of these walls who are going through life without a promise, who are going through life right now when something happens to them, they don't know who to hold on to. They don't know what to do because they don't have the promise that we have. They don't have the hope that we have. They don't know anything else to grasp onto except what the world gives them. And if you haven't noticed, the world's pretty empty, very fleeting changes with a breath. But you and I have the opportunity by living as Christ has called us to be the person that points them to Jesus. True hope. Real life. We remember Memorial Day. We remember everything that's there. But in the end, we would never have any of that freedom if not for Christ. Nothing of that would matter if not for Christ. This morning, are you being the living memorial that God has called you to be? See, a lot of people think of the word of memorial, and and we always think memorials have to be very sad and somber, don't they? We hear memorial and we think of memorial. I want sometimes the memorial to be something celebratory. Because if I'm a memorial for Jesus... There's nothing sad about that. If I am a sign, a symbol, a monument, a memorial for Christ, what he did and for God's power, that should get somebody excited. It shouldn't be something sad. Just because there's something that ended, memorial of what was my past, there is something so much greater that has begun. A new life in Christ. Go ahead and stand with me real quick do things a little bit different now than I did this morning. I don't even know where I'm going with ending this one. That's okay. So you never know which service they're going to, I don't know which service they're going to show because it'll be different. Um, What I had did in the first service was that if you wanted to, to be, if you were that Christian who, who has, has lived your life and who was doing everything you, you think, but you're not really being that memorial, not really standing up for Jesus, you're not really being that person that could, could point and people would be like, wow, 
man, I just see Jesus in everything they do. Then I wanted us to, to stand this morning and to, to be that. To say, yes, I want to be that. Lord, I want to be a memorial for you. I want to do everything for you. But God is calling this morning, that in this time, in this moment, that if that is you and we want to be that, then it takes more than just standing up. It takes actually doing something. And so for right now, this morning, if you want to, if you want to be that person, if you want to say, Lord, I want to be a living memorial, I want to be a living stone for you, I want to, to do something for you, I want my life to represent who you are, I want my life to point people to you in everything that I do. If that's you, I'm just going to ask you to come forward with me. And just a minute as we get ready to close this service, we'll, we'll pray. But I want us to take just that actual step of saying, yes, Lord, I'm not hidden anymore. I'm not, I'm not what used to be. I'm what is. I'm something better. So if that's you and you want to want to do that, want to declare that this morning, would you just step up here with me? There's plenty of room. Don't worry. This is that moment that we have to actually take a stand. We have to be willing to say that, yes, I want to be that. So if that's you, just come on forward. Nothing, nothing has to be fancy this morning. You know, another thing I love when we come to God, we don't have to be our best. We don't have to be the, the prettiest, the fanciest. We don't have to do things in a certain way. You know that? Now, sometimes we think that it's uncomfortable. Maybe this is uncomfortable for you, but I'm not worried about that this morning. Sometimes uncomfortable is good. Sometimes being willing just to say, Lord, I want to do everything for you is uncomfortable. I was challenged just after the first service. I was challenged by somebody I was talking to here that they, they said, you know, their, their mother, their memory of their mom was that every time somebody would call up as a telemarketer, they would lead them, try and lead them to Christ. I'm the first one that you can ask my kids. The moment that phone rings, and I pick it up and it's a telemarketer. I'm like, thank you. Have a nice day. Goodbye. You don't even get to open your mouth when you call my house. That's got to change because I don't know what's going on on the other end of that line. I don't know what that person's going through. They're doing their job. And that's on me to make a change. Heavenly Father, this morning, I just praise you. Lord, I praise you. I praise you. I praise you for who you are. God, that in the middle of the worst of the moments, God, the darkest days, the the worst things in our life, we can cry out to you. We can lift our hands and we can say, Lord, we love you. Thank you. I praise you. Because you are worthy of all praise and all honor. God, we praise you in everything, the good and the bad. Lord, as you take us from what was and you cross us over, Lord, as they they crossed across that Jordan, Lord, as they, they moved over into the promised land, Lord, so we cross over from death to life because of you, because of being washed in your blood. Lord, we go from the old into the new. Lord, may we be willing to stand up and say, I want to be a living stone. I want to be a memorial, a monument for your glory and your power, for your greatness, for your love and your grace and your mercy that you poured out on the cross for me. Lord, I thank you for each person who's here today. Lord, even people who didn't walk up, God, I just pray that you would bless them. Lord, there is just so much of you in this place, Lord, to just be poured out on all of us. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We praise you for who you are. God, may we leave this place different than we came in. May today be a day, God, that you would bring people into our path that we can just tell about you. Lord, may we be a living stone. That when people see us, we point them straight to you. Because you deserve all honor and all glory. Lord, I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Before you leave this morning, everybody, as you're, you're headed out again, like I said, with the, the river thing, I just process things differently. I, I need reminders sometimes. And as you leave out both exits, there's going to be an usher or someone there's going to hand you just a little stone. It's nothing fancy, but it's just a river rock. And it's a reminder that you are a stone. You're a living stone for him. Put it in your pocket, throw it on your dash, stick it somewhere at home that when you walk by, that'll be a reminder just to trigger back to you. That's right. 
I can be that. As that stone reminds me, I can remind and point somebody else to Jesus. Amen. All right, guys. Have a great week. Bless. Thank you. It was wonderful being here with you guys. Have a great weekend.